I sometimes like to think of myself as well-rounded. I've worked as a philosopher, a welder, and a landscaper. I watch French art films, but also can't get enough of pay-per-view boxing matches. I eat as much Indian cuisine as barbecue, read as many comics as headlines, listen to as much country radio as avant-garde jazz. But when I compare what I like to think of as my own well-roundedness with that of Aristotle's, it is sort of like comparing apples and, well, the current political climate of Pakistan. There simply is no comparison. Indeed, Aristotle, in addition to being a philosopher, was a medical doctor, biologist, and one of the world's first book collectors. He was a student of Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great, citizen of Macedonia and resident of Greece. His biological writings maintained authority in their field for over a thousand years. His philosophical writings are still considered essential reading for any serious philosophy student. So then, as we work through Aristotle's ethics over the course of the next week, let's keep this in mind. Aristotle wasn't some philosopher who knew nothing but philosophy. He was rather a man seriously interested in all that life had to offer, a man who could not help but throw himself into the world and try to understand it, a man for whom philosophy was just one part of a worthwhile existence. This breadth of interest and experience permeates Aristotle's ethics. Indeed, Aristotle's ethics are never strictly an exercise in philosophy or abstract concepts, but rather an attempt to understand the world using his own observation of and participation in that world. So, with this at the back of our minds, let's dive in. Aristotle begins his ethics in a unique way. Other philosophers, as we have seen, typically begin their ethics with a statement of the good life. For Kant, remember, the good life was acting with a good will. For Mill, it was acting to produce happiness in the world, and so on. Aristotle, however, points out that such an opening statement is premature, that before we can talk about the good life, we must first have some sort of idea of goodness in general. And so, like Arthur in Search of the Holy Grail and Simon Cowell in Search of the Next American Idol, Aristotle begins his search for the good. The quest starts with this question. Are good things always good in the same way? This is sort of like asking, are all white things white in the same way? Clearly they are. A white leisure suit and a white Lamborghini are both white in the same way, even though the latter is the subject of dream, the former the subject of nightmare. So are good things, like white things, are all good things good in the same way? The answer, Aristotle believes, is no. This is perhaps best illuminated by a quote from G.K. Chesterton, British theologian, academic, and jokester. Namely, Chesterton once observed the following. The word good has many meanings. For example, if a man were to shoot his grandmother at a range of 500 yards, I would call him a good shot, but not necessarily a good man. Okay, so unless you're ready to call the grandmother killer a good guy, it seems that goodness, unlike whiteness, does not always mean the same thing. But does this mean that good is just an arbitrary term applicable to anything and everything, like cool or hip or retro or hot? Well, says Aristotle, this isn't really the case either, because it seems there, there are t at least two common threads running through all things we call good. First, goodness captures something that is aimed at. And second, goodness captures the proper function of something. Aristotle's definition of goodness here admittedly makes the whole discussion even more confusing, but I think it will become clear if we go back to the Chesterton quote. We want to call the man a good shot, remember? Well, says Aristotle, my definition of goodness can explain this. Goodness simply means that which is aimed at and the proper function of something. Clearly, the guy is hitting what he is aiming at, and is functioning extremely well as a marksman. Therefore, we can call him a good shot. Okay, Aristotle, but what about the man himself? We want to call him a good shot, but a bad man. No problem, says Aristotle. You see, we don't think people should be aiming at the title of grandmother killer, nor would we refer to the grandmother killers as properly functioning humans. Therefore, as the guy is killing his grandma, he is functioning improperly and be can be called a bad guy. Aristotle's definition of good thus does seem to account for the various types of goodness. At any rate, it is able to account for the types of goodness present, present in Chesterton's morbid thought experiment by explaining what, why we call the man a good shot, but not a good man. With an idea of what we mean by goodness in general, continues Aristotle, we are thus ready to investigate what is good for the human, that is, the good life. All we have to do is figure out what it is that humans aim at and what it means for a human to function properly. Sound tough? 
Aristotle doesn't really think so. He says, well, it's pretty obvious what humans aim at. We aim at happiness. Everything we value, from pleasure to honor to generosity, all really boil down to forms of happiness. Therefore, the good life is the happy life. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, I can see where this is going, utilitarianism. And indeed, Aristotle's declara declaration that happiness is the good at which humans aim does seem rather utilitarian. However, it's actually not this simple. This is because Aristotle defines happiness in a way very different from utilitarianism. Utilitarians, if you remember, said that happiness consists in maximum pleasure and minimum pain. Aristotle, on the other hand, thinks happiness means something more like doing well or flourishing. If it's hard for you to see the difference here, just think about the concept of a happy flower. For a utilitarian, such a no notion would be absurd. A flower cannot feel pleasure or pain and so cannot be happy. For Aristotle, on the other hand, a happy flower makes perfect sense. That is, it is perfectly possible to describe a flower as doing well or flourishing. But this new definition of happiness creates a bit of a problem. Indeed, if you remember back to our discussion of utilitarianism, it was relatively clear what was meant by pleasure and pain. Therefore, it was relatively clear what was meant by the utilitarian claim that the good life was the happy life. However, this is not the same for Aristotle. Indeed, it is far from clear what he means to what, what it means to say that a human is doing well or flourishing. It is thus far from clear what Aristotle means when he says the good life is the happy life. Therefore, Arist if Aristotle is to give us an idea of the good life, he is going to have to give us a better explanation of what he means by happiness, what he means by flourishing. The best way to offer such an explanation, proposes Aristotle, is to think about a properly functioning human. Remember, good things have two characteristics. They are aimed at by something, and they are the proper function of that something. We can rephrase this and say that a, thing's, a thing aims at its good, which is in turn its proper function. As we already know that humans aim at the good of happiness, it thus must be the case that happiness captures the proper function of the human. To clarify what it means to be happy, what it means to flourish as a human, we thus no, need only think about what it means for a human to function properly. So, begins Aristotle, what goes in to a properly functioning human? First of all, Aristotle points out, humans are clearly reasonably creature, reasonable creatures. We have common sense, and using it to think through things is what we do best. Therefore, acting reasonably with common sense must be a part of a functioning properly as a human. Aristotle refers to this aspect of proper human function as excellence or virtue. But virtue, continues Aristotle, is only part of what it means to function properly as a human. Indeed, just like anything else, humans need to be in the right conditions in order to be at their best. Cars don't run well in the cold, and people don't run well without enough food, water, and friends. Furthermore, and again, just like anything else, we wouldn't want to say that a human was functioning properly if she did so for only a short period of time. A good lawnmower must run well for its entire life, as must a human. With this, then, we have arrived at a definition of a properly functioning and thus happy human. Namely, a happy human is one who acts reasonably, according to common sense, in good circumstances over the course of a lifetime. With this definition of happiness, then, Aristotle has at long last arrived at a description of the good life. The good life is the happy life, as happiness is that at which we as humans aim. Happiness, in turns, means something like doing well, which, as our proper function, means living a reasonable existence in decent conditions throughout the course of a lifetime. Aristotle's good life is thus rather different than the good lives proposed by other philosophers we have studied so far this semester. Indeed, for Aristotle, the good life has less to do with our actions, more to do with the type of people we are. For Aristotle, living the good life is not as simple as acting so as to produce happiness or acting out of a good will. Rather, the good life is something we must cultivate and nurture over the course of a lifetime, something we can only achieve through rigorous training. The methods of this training will be the subject of my next lecture.